Well, let's talk a little bit about um, big trials with uh, the newer proteasome inhibitor. There's been a lot of data. We've talked about a lot of data combining carfilzomib, but do we really know the right dose of carfilzomib? Um, so, so maybe I can take a first stab, and I know we're going to talk a little bit more about this, and, and uh, we'll hear comments from others. But just as, as background and recap, we heard about the Aspire data at the ASH meeting, mm -hmm. and, and that showed that the three-drug combination of carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone was superior to lenalidomide and dexamethasone. Lots of caveats, like, you know, the one that, which is very important if you follow a patient closely, you know, can you, can you try still an RD type approach? But the reality, and this goes back to your point, is that we are finding that these three drug combinations can have levels of response, um, for instance, an in Aspire CR of about a quarter of the patients that are similar to what we saw historically with newly diagnosed patients. And that, in my mind, was a, a, a paradigm-changing sort of result because then we start thinking about deep responses in the relapse and refractory setting, which I think will apply as we talk about these larger studies. Uh, because traditionally, you know, the way we think about myeloma upfront, I, I think many of us are convinced now that there's a fraction of patients that can be cured, so we go for the cure. So it's a 400 meter dash. Once you're in the relapse and refractory, is the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, but these studies are starting to challenge some of those notions. And, and, you know, does that matter? I think we know that response matters, but to what extent does deep response matter in the relapse and refractory? So that's just the background. I know we're going we're gonna to talk more about uh, the Endeavor trial and the Champion trial as well, too. Uh, but, but I think uh, the good news is this is all positive. We're, you have more options for patients. Okay. Anybody else? Dosing? Well, do Berenson uh, uh, in Los Angeles, probably sympathetic to Heather's plight with parking and driving, uh, looked at moving carfilzomib to a once-weekly schedule, actually escalating the dose up to 70 milligrams per meter squared. And I think that's not trivial to be able to move something from twice a week to once a week. There are a number of other investigators, including in Italy, that are looking at a once weekly carfilzomib schedule. I think those are really important explorations as we try to figure, just as bortezomib went to once a week, then sub-Q. Mm -hmm. uh, I think these are important issues. So we've talked about CAR, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, you know, I think the dose and schedule is certainly uh, in development, as it were. We know sort of a baseline, but there may be easier ways to do it. What do we know about POM um, in terms of its ability to combine or use either as a single agent or in the combination setting in a relapsed myeloma setting? So you have the data of, uh, which got pomalidomide approved now uh, mm -hmm. more than a year back uh, now, and that has continued to show a survival benefit. It's also shown a survival benefit in the high-risk patient population. And now we're going forward with combining pomalidomide with a whole bunch of other drugs. Uh, the registration strategy, the confirmatory registration strategy for pomalidomide is going to be pomalidomide in combination with bortezomib and dexamethasone versus uh, bortezomib dex, and that's an ongoing trial. And uh, at least the phase one, two studies, which we were very involved with, um, it's extremely well tolerated. It partners really quite nicely with the proteasome inhibitor, and hopefully we will see good positive results with this. In addition to that, we've mentioned some of the newer drugs that we're combining with, specifically, I think the HDAC uh, inhibitors can certainly uh, partner nicely with pomalidomide and we're seeing very nice efficacy as well as tolerability. So let me ask then, we saw data at ASH certainly that looked at POM plus Cyclo. Uh, we've seen data from Jayton with POM plus CAR. We've seen data with POM plus Bortezomib. And there is some POM HDAC data out there as well. Why would you ever use POM DEX? You don't. You don't ever use POM DEX. Or you can disagree. That's a <laughs> Uh, actually, we do have a trial where we use um, POM biaxin dex okay. after first relapse okay. um, in the uh, plus minus a second transplant. Okay. Um, we have partners across the street mm -hmm. uh, at Cornell where the chlorothromycin was studied and and. Sure. Uh, and it, there's some good data to suggest that it partners well with dexamethasone and the mm -hmm. image. So um, in that setting, we use the, the, that three drug combination, a very select patient population. Sure. But I think that barring that uh, clinical trial, more often than not, there's no reason to 
use pomalidomide and dexamethasone without a without a third drug. Okay. I just want to add one thing to that. You know, we talked a little bit about this. We talked about uh, Raphael mentioned the Aspire data, and this is the first uh, data set which has actually shown us that even in the relapse setting, combinations is the way to go. And I just want to bring it back to the genetics of myeloma. We've talked a lot about clonal heterogeneity. We've talked a little bit about clonal evolution. And with every relapse, our myeloma patients are going to clonally evolve. And for them, when we've started treating them with upfront combinations, to imagine that we're going to be able to get away with doublets is hard in this stage in the game. I do think most of our patients are going to need combinations in the relapse setting as well. Okay, Jaden, as the, the PI for CARPOM, how often do you use POM DEX alone? Um, so just limited to patients who can't tolerate um, mm -hmm. from a um, okay. cytopenia perspective, but I think um, for the most patients uh, would do CARPOM DEX from patients who have heavily refractory disease. And now as we move carfilzomib up front, I think that'll change. But that's a really tough question, and I agree with you 100%. Yeah, yeah. You know, you get a call from a hospital, one of your, your colleagues who's in the consult service, and says, <laughs> Sagar, your patient has not seen POM. You know, what does that mean? Am I going to do POM DEX? Am I going right. to add pomalotomide to cytoxan dexamethasone? Am I going to combine it with bortezomib? It's very hard to know exactly what to do with those patients. And I think your question is really spot on. I would say conceptually we're moving more and more to combinations. I'd like to say that one of the things we have to be careful about, just like uh, Jetin was saying about being careful regarding can we ask the question, is to extrapolate from other diseases. Frequently when one talks about combinations, the topic will come up to say, well, in breast cancer they've shown that, you know, this was not a good strategy. I think every disease and every tumor is different, and, and we all agree, while we don't have the data, it would be ideal to have clinical trials for this, but right now, I think there's a greater inclination for combinatorial strategies. Well, but I think that's really important because this is what I mean, I think it's almost consensus across the table, which is rare. Um, <laughs> but in the community, I think most POM is being given as POM DEX. So, I mean, I think we, we, need, we need to make sure we have the justification for what we're doing because it certainly changes the cost parameters around it. Well, the, that depends. I mean, uh, a lot of the patients that I'm referred have been through two proteasome inhibitors and two IMIDs but have either never seen an alkylating agent or haven't seen it since they got one day of melphalan high dose for a transplant. And this issue about pomalidomide cyclophosphamide is, is still important to me. And although we haven't really discussed it very much, I think bendamustine, and, and even though it's a relatively old drug, has activity and is oftentimes below the awareness, below the waterline for a lot of practicing clinicians. And so I find that Melphalan, cyclophosphamide, and bendamustine, once we've gone through five other novel drugs, mm -hmm. is still something that has to be kept in our mind as a potential for salvage for these patients. And so, you know, I think coming back to your point about, you know, when's the right time to use just palm dex. Um, so I think you make a good point because I think there's a, there's a, um, we have to bridge what happens in the community. And so when we see patients, we may see them, as you mentioned, after five, six lines of therapy, and combinations are important because they have resistant disease. And that's where we're studying this in clinical trials, and that's what our practice is. But once you go out into the community, patients may have just progressed after just RevDex or, you know, some combination of alkylating-based therapy. And so they may be using POMDEX in earlier lines of therapy. And I think Martha Lacey showed very nicely that when you do POMDEX in one to three lines of therapy, your overall response rate is going to be 60% plus, right? So it's not going to be in your low 30% or a single digit with single agent POM. Right. So in fact, I think there is a role in the community for palm decks for earlier lines of therapy. So I don't think that it's a dead combination. For the heavily refractory where we see patients and the trials are done, I agree. But in the community, I think there's still a role for palm decks in earlier lines of therapy. Okay, all right. Well, this has been a really good discussion. Before we end